Okay, we're in chapter one on the whole numbers. This is section 1.2, adding and subtracting whole numbers. So we'll first start off with some definitions. So what is an add-end or a term? Well, these are the numbers that are being added together. So uh, most of the time we call them add-ends. Eventually we'll start calling them terms as well because we'll, we'll have polynomials and they'll, we'll call them a term at that point in time when we add different things together that way. But when it's a simple addition like five plus seven, the five and seven here are both the add-ends. And again, like I said, it could also be uh, use the word terms. This depends on how, how you want to look at it. Some people like this one better, some people like this one. Um, both of them are valid. Now we can add 5 and 7 on our hands, we can do it all different ways, but we're going to start out with adding 5 and 7 on a number line. So first we're going to draw a number line, we're going to start at 0, and then we're going to draw an arrow 5 units to the right. And this arrow has a magnitude of 5, which represents the whole number 5. So let's do that first. So we're going to start at 0, then we'll have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. That should be good. And so we want to draw an arrow 5 units to the right, starting here. So we'll have a line, and then we'll go 5 units. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that's at 5. And so that gets us to that point right there, okay? And then we're going to draw a second arrow of length 7 starting at the end of the first arrow that represented the 5. So we're going to start here and draw another arrow of length 7. Now this new arrow is going to have a magnitude of 7 as well, and it represents the whole number 7. All right, somehow we bumped out of here, so let's try to get back where we were. And so what we're going to do is going to draw 7. So we have uh, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And so when we do that, we'll draw up to this point here. And at that point, that is going to be our solution. So the sum of 5, remember, this has a magnitude of 5. This one has a magnitude of 7. So 5 plus 7 is equal to that 12, okay? And so we're going to mark that dot at the whole number 12, and that tells us our sum of 5 and 7 is 12. And so this is one way we can uh, add on a number line. Now, with a commutative property addition, what we can do is we can say, okay, there's two numbers, let them be A and B. And what we can do is we can say we can take A plus B, and that's the same thing as taking b plus a. So order that we add really doesn't matter, okay? And so if we go back to our problem with 5 plus 7, we could have done 5 plus 7 or 7 plus 5. So what we could have done is said, okay, well, let's start with 0. Then we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And we also need a 7. And so what we're going to do is first time we did from here, we went five units and then stopped. And then we went seven more units and we stopped and we got 12. So we had five plus seven. Well, we could have also done seven plus five. So we could have done five here and seven here. It didn't matter the order. And we still end up here at our 12. Okay, so that kind of shows that the commutative property of addition works. Now, when we're doing addition, subtraction, everything we're going to do eventually, we have things called grouping symbols. And so we can use parentheses, brackets, or braces to delimit the part of an expression you want to evaluate first. Because what you are going to do is anything in the grouping symbols is first, and then you kind of work your way out. So if they're nested, you evaluate the innermost pair of grouping symbols first, and then you go out, and you go out, and you go out until you get them all done. Now, what do parentheses look like? Well, they're just, uh, you know, kind of like the frowny face or happy face, depending on which way you look here. Brackets are the square ones, and braces are kind of the curly Q ones. And so those are the three types of grouping symbols uh, we can use here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to find the sum paying attention to grouping symbols. So now we're not really going to go ahead and draw the number line every time because we kind of know that, you know, we can use our fingers or however it is, but we're adding two numbers together. So what we're going to do is work in grouping symbols first. So 2 plus 4 
is in parentheses. So what's 2 plus 4? Well, that's 6. Then we still have plus 6. And 6 plus 6, well, that's 12. Okay. Now this time we have brackets, not parentheses. And so we take 3 plus 7, well, that's 10. And then we still have plus 4. Well, 10 plus 4 is 14. Now this time we have braces instead of brackets or parentheses. And it's just to show you that it doesn't matter which grouping symbol we have, we do the same thing. So here we take 1 plus 3, we get 4 plus 8. Well, 4 plus 8 is 12. Now the last one here is kind of to show you the nesting. And so we can see we have 2 plus, and then we have a bracket, and that in brackets over here. And then we have 4 plus, and then we have parentheses, and the in parentheses here. And then we have 7 plus, and then we have braces, and 1 plus 3. So we have to work with the most inner one first. Well, the most inner thing first is this. So we're going to rewrite this as 2 plus bracket, 4 plus 7 parentheses, plus, now one plus three is four, and so we're dropping the braces once we add those together, and we keep the parentheses and the bracket here. Now we've only got two sets of grouping symbols. Here we had three. Now we're gonna do this one, seven plus four. So if we rewrite this again, we'll have two plus bracket, four plus, well now seven plus four, that's gonna give us 11, and this time we're dropping the parentheses, and we still have brackets. Now we have just the brackets, so we'll have 2 plus, well, 4 plus 11 is going to give us 15. And now we just have the final addition, 2 plus 15 is 17. And that would be our final answer. But what we had to do is first this one, and then we did this one, and then we did that one. So we did the first set of grouping symbols, then the second, and then the third, going from the innermost all the way out to the outermost. Now we have another property of addition called the associative property of addition. And what we're going to do is we're going to let A, B, and C represent whole numbers. Then we have the parentheses A plus B in parentheses plus C is equal to A plus B plus C in parentheses. So we can associate the first two and then add C after that. Or we can associate the last two and then add A to that and both ways it's equal. Doesn't matter which way we do it. So the associative property of addition. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna show an example here. We're gonna do what's in parentheses first here and here, and then we'll work our way down. Well, four plus two is six plus seven, and that's equal to four plus, well here's seven plus two is nine. Well, six plus seven is 13. Nine plus four is 13 and it works out, okay? Now, we also have the identity, uh, additive identity property here. And with the additive identity, basically we have the whole number zero, it's called the additive identity. And so if A is any whole number, then if we add zero to that, we get back A. So A plus that additive identity is equal to A. So adding zero to any number, it doesn't change the solution. It just goes back to whatever it is. So A plus nothing is still A, okay? All right, so here we have uh, something a little bit different. Before we were doing small numbers, you know, four, two, seven, things like that. Well, what if we have larger numbers? Well, if we add larger numbers, what we have to do is we have to add the numbers in a vertical format. That's the most easy. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna line up the ones column. So kind of going back to the first section, we had to know where the ones, the tens, the hundreds, the thousands, 10,000, 100,000 is. We have to line them up so each one is in the proper thing. And then we add from right to left and be sure, be sure to carry when necessary. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rewrite this in vertical format. So I'm gonna write the two, four, eight, seven first, then four, two, seven below that, and the four is in the hundreds, and that four is in the hundreds, so the four, two, seven has to line up in this fashion. So the sevens are both in the ones, eights are both in, eight and two is both in the tens, the two fours are in the hundreds, and the twos in the thousands. So now I'm gonna start on the right side and add seven plus seven is 14. Well, I just write the ones part down, which is a four, and I carry the tens part up here. <clears throat> now I take eight plus two is 10, 
plus that one is 11. So I write the ones part here and I carry the part over here. And then I have four plus four is eight, plus one is nine, nothing to carry here. And then two plus zero is two. And so then my solution is 2,914, adding 2,487 to 427, okay? Now, it works the same way as if we have three. We just have to line up three in a row in a vertical format. So we have three, seven, eight, two, four, three, and six, four, one. And we're just writing in vertical format, and we're going to add those together. So again, we're going to start on the right column, add down, and carry when necessary, and then find out what our final solution will be. Well, here we have 8 plus 3 is 11, plus 1 is 12. Carry the 1. Here we have 4 and 4 is 8, and 7 and 1 is 8, so 8 plus 8 is 16. Carry the 1. And here we have 6. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And there's no other column, so we just go ahead and write that 1 in front because it's going to be 1 plus nothing. And so we have 1,262 is the solution to the sum of those three numbers. Okay. Now subtraction. It works pretty much the same way as addition, except when you get to the point where we're subtracting off, say, this 5, instead of going to the right, which is adding, we're going to go left, because remember, it goes smaller when we go left. So let's start with 0 here, and then we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Not always equally spaced, obviously. It doesn't look like, but we're going to change a little bit there. That makes We'll make it better. Make it there. We go. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And so we're going to start with our first number, eight. So we'll start here and go eight. So we'll go all the way out here to our eight. Okay. And so that's eight units. Now we're going to go left, negative means we're going to go left, five units. So we'll start here and go left five units. So five units is one, two, three, four, five. So we're going to go up to that point here, and the magnitude is five. So we're going to go positive eight this way, and then we're going to go left five units this way. So this is positive units right, negative units left. And where does that tell us we're at? We're at three. And so that means 8 minus 5 is equal to 3. So again, <clears throat> this is to kind of show you conceptually what it is. We don't always have to do it this way. If you need to to help you on a test or a quiz or homework, this is fine. Um, no calculators are allowed for the class. So, you know, fingers, toes, and number lines are all allowed. Okay. Now with subtraction, there's a couple things that don't work. Subtraction is not commutative. Okay, so we can't go uh, and do the commutative property like we did before. And so that means is we can't say 7 minus 5 is equal to 5 minus 7. Because if you think about it, 7 minus 5, well, that's equal to 2. 5 minus 7, well, what happens here is we're starting to get into the negative numbers. So if we've gone here 5, then we go back 7, we're over here at a negative 2. Okay. And so those two are not equal. So commutative property does not work. It's out the window. And it's also not associative because we can't change who we're associating with and get the same number. So if we had 9 minus 5 minus 2, well, 9 minus 5 is 4. 4 minus 2 is 2. But here, if we take 9 minus 5 minus 2, associating the last two, well, 5 minus 2 is 3. 9 minus 3, that's 6. 2 does not equal 6. And so it's not associative and it's not commutative, okay? So both of those uh, do not work here. So subtraction is one of those special ones. You can't do everything you do with addition. And so that's something to note. Now, what about subtraction of larger numbers that are whole? Well, it's, it works the same way as with addition. And in fact, you have to line up the ones column, the tens, the hundreds, thousands, and so on. And then with subtraction, there's something called borrowing. And so let's kind of get down to it. Let's write it out first here. We, so we have 2, 5, 3, 2. And we're going to take 4, 2, 7. 
and we're subtracting off. <clears throat> so what we're looking at is we're going to take the, large, the top number minus the bottom number. Well, 2 minus 7, well, 2 is not large enough to subtract 7 off because that will give us a negative number. And so what we have to do is we have to borrow. And that means we're going to borrow basically 10 of them from here. So this is considered as 10 of them. So if we take one of those away, that becomes 2. But if we add 10 here, that becomes 12. So now we have 12 minus 7. Well, we can do that. 12 minus 7 is 5. Now here we have 2 minus 2. Well, that's just 0. 5 minus 4 is 1. And 2 minus 0 is 2. And so then we get our solution is 2,105. And that's after subtracting off the 427 from the 2532. And here is where we did that borrowing. Okay, and we'll do some more examples with borrowing here in a little bit, but that's how we do it. Now we can always check our answer to see if we've done the subtraction right by adding the last two numbers together because we subtracted that off from that one. So if we add the bottom two, we should get that top one back. So seven plus five, well, that's 12. We're going to carry the one. Two plus one is three. Four plus one is five. Two plus zero is two. And look, we get the same answer. So we do know that that is a correct answer. So this is one of the ways we can do a check, make sure we get the correct answer, we don't get it wrong. And that's, that's a simple thing we can do with subtraction. <clears throat> Now we have orders of operations. Now, order of operations here is we're only worried about addition and subtraction right now. Eventually, we're going to have all kinds of other stuff, and we'll use PEMDAS. But right now, we're just worried about addition and subtraction only. So what we have to do is we have to perform an order presented moving from left to right. Okay, So we're going to go basically and go from left to right, no matter what's written. And that's how we're going to solve it. So this says 17 minus 5 plus 6. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take 17, and we're going to subtract 5 off. Well, here we don't have to borrow. 7 minus 5, that's 2. 1 minus 0 is 1. And we get 12. So then this part is now 12, and we still have plus 6. So if we want to line them up, we have 12 plus 6. 6 plus 2 is 8. You don't have to carry anything. And then 1 plus 0 is 1. And so that then is our solution. So that's equal to 18. Okay. Now again, this is only when we do addition and subtraction. If there's nothing, if there's other things like multiply, divide, you know, powers, exponents, whatever then something else applies. But just with those only, we just go from left to right, and we get our answer, and it's going to be then the correct answer. Okay, so now we're kind of going to go off on a tangent. We're going to talk about polygons, but the reason we're talking about polygons is because we can add up their sides and get a perimeter. And so a polygon basically is just some kind of a plain figure. Plain meaning like a piece of paper. You can draw it on a piece of paper and uh, you can see it, um, or you can look at, at a stop sign or, and see that it's you know an octagon, things like that. But it's uh, basically a figure made up of a closed path of finite sequence of segments. And so if we look down here at our hexagon, each one of these lines is going to be a segment. Okay, And that's what they're talking about, the segments. And these are the edges or the sides of the polygon. And then the points where the two edges meet are called the vertices of the polygon. So each one of these places where they meet, in this case here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here, each one of those is a vertex, or a plural is vertices, okay? So if we think about a square that has four sides, and each corner of the square is a vertex, and each of those four sides is called an edge, okay? So, you know, then we can think about the square, or as we've been working along, we thought about this hexagon. Now, the perimeter of a polygon, basically, is we're just going to take the sum of all the lengths of its sides. For a square example, we just add the four sides together to find the perimeter. And so, you know, a square, each side is exactly the same. And so, you know, that's just going to be if we say this is S. Okay, let's S, 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 S. The perimeter is just going to be 4S because we're just going to take S plus S plus S and we have 4S's, okay? 
Now let's look at a hexagon specifically. <clears throat> now this one is drawn so the sides are of different lengths. So we don't have something nice like, oh, well, we can just take six times two and get our perimeter. We have to take and look at each side and add it together. So the perimeter, now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to maybe mark the first one I do, that way I know where I'm at. So I'm gonna say this is first, and then I'm going to move around clockwise. So I'll have three plus, here we'll have two plus two plus three plus two plus two. And now I'm back here. I've already put that one so I don't have to do it. It should have six points. One, two, three, four, five, six. And so now I just have to add those together. And if I just go from left to right, which is our order of operations, I'll take three plus two is five. Five plus two is seven. Well, if I notice this is equal to this. So if this is seven, then I take seven plus seven. Well, that's just 14. And so that would be my parameter, but I've got to include my units, 14 meters, okay? So when you're doing just the numbers, you can add them without having units. But when you go back and do that, you have to put the units in your answer. So whenever you're doing a perimeter or something, be sure to look at what the units are, meters or feet or inches or centimeters. Something is going to be a unit. And so you should probably have that when you're typing in your answer. Otherwise, you might not have a correct answer. All right, so that's how we do perimeter for hexagon. Now, let's look at the difference between a rectangle and a square. We kind of talked about the square already. They're all sides are the same. But technically, a rectangle is all angles are right angles. And so each one of these, if we look at it, it's a blue box. Those are 90 degree angles. And that's how, if, you're, if you remember high school, probably geometry or, or some math class, if it's a 90 degree angle, they would just say, okay, well, you know, these are all 90 degree angles. Or if you had maybe a right triangle, you know, that was a 90 degree angle. These two were different, okay? So those are all the, all the blue boxes are 90 degree angles and the opposite sides are equal length. So if you notice here, this is two meters and this is two meters, but this one is five meters and this one is five meters. So opposite sides are the same and they're different here for a rectangle, but here for a square, all angles, again, are right angles, 90 degrees, the blue boxes, but all four sides are equal length. So two, 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 because that, that's the definition of a square. So let's say we wanna find the perimeter of these two polygons now, okay? Well, with this one, let's say we're gonna start with this one and that's first. So we'll have five plus two plus five plus two. And again, I'm just going around clockwise and then and once I get back to here I stop so I only have four numbers and if I think about that that's a five plus two that's a five plus two and so that's going to be a seven plus seven and we have 14 again okay <clears throat> now this one we have two plus two plus two plus two and again that was meters and so here we have two plus two and this is two plus two so that's going to be four plus four and that's gonna be 16, wait, eight, ha. Huh. I don't know why I said 16. I was squaring some things there, I believe. Uh, taking four times four. And so that's actually eight, okay? Now that's again, meters. Now, remember what I said about how we could say, well, you know, that's S plus S plus S plus S. And so that was gonna be four times S. Well, we could have done the same thing here. We could have said, well, that's gonna be four times two, which is still eight meters, but we just took four times two. Now this one, if we think about that, we had two of these and two of those. So if we remember kind of how rectangles work, the longer side is the length, the shorter side is the width. We could take and say two times L plus two times W is going to be equal to the perimeter. And if we did that, we'd have two times five plus two times two, and that's gonna be 10 plus four, which is 14. So we kind of have to start thinking about how things work because eventually we're gonna start seeing equations in a form like this where that's equal to our perimeter. And this is again meters for our final thing. 
And so that's perimeter. And here we had perimeter is equal to 4s, okay? Or in our case, 4 times 2, which is 8 meters. All right. <clears throat> so that's how rectangles and squares work and how we can add up the sides or the edges and get our perimeter. All right, so this one we have, Emily shows improvement on each successive examination throughout the term. Her exam scores are recorded in the following table. So we can see over here all of her exam scores and what, what they are. What it wants us to do is create a bar plot. So if you remember from section 1.1, we created bar plots for her exam scores. And then we're gonna place the exam numbers on the horizontal axis in the same order shown in the table. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And then our uh, y-axis is going to be the actual score. That's for part A. Part B says create a table that shows the successive differences in exam scores. So, you know, the difference between two and one, three and two, four and three, five and four, six and five, and get those differences. And then make a line plot of those differences. And then what we're going to do with that line plot is looking at that, between which two exams did she show the greatest improvement? And so we'll see, hopefully, <clears throat> one of them between two things is gonna be the greatest improvement. All right, so let's first do our bar plot. So these are exam number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, and number six. And we're going from, uh, let, let's say we start here down here at 45, and maybe then we can go, let's see, 50, 55, 60, 65, 70, and then we could do another 75. So we're gonna go by five. So that's 50, 55, 60, 65, 70, 75. All right, so now I'm making bar plot. Number one, 48. <clears throat> so it goes up, not quite to 50, and that would be our bar chart. Number two, 51. So this one, we go up a little bit over 50, and we have that one. And we go to 54, which is just under that 55 mark. Number four goes into 59, so we're even higher. Number five goes up to 67. So somewhere in there, maybe. And the last one goes to 70. Okay, so that's part A. <clears throat> and so these are the scores. And these are exam numbers, okay? And now it wants us to do uh, differences in exam scores. So what we're gonna do is, these are gonna be a difference table. Okay. And so going from, let's say we go from exam one to exam two, and then exam two to exam three, exam three to exam four, exam four to exam five, and exam five to exam six, okay? <clears throat> what we're gonna do is, how did she improve? So we're gonna take this latter minus first. So we'll take exam score two minus exam score one. So we'll take 58 minus 41. 50, or 51 minus 48, sorry. Oops. 51 minus 48. And what does that equal? Well, that's equal to three. Now we'll go from 54 minus 51. And that's also three. And then from four to three, we're going to 59 minus 54. And nine minus four, that's going to give us a five. And then five is 67 minus the 59. So that's going to give us eight. And 70 minus 67, that's back to three, okay? And so at this point, we could say, well, this is going to be the biggest difference going from four to five. We get the biggest jump in positive, but we're supposed to kind of look at our, our plot here. So now what we're going to do is we're going to draw a graph and we'll make our line chart. 
And so we're going to go from uh, one to two, and then we'll go from uh, two to three, and three to four, and four to five, and five to six. And okay, one, two, two, three, three. Four. All right. And now we need to know the numbers three, three, five, eight, three. So it's three, three, five, eight, three. And so well, let's go up here and say, okay, let's go by two. So two, four, six, eight. And we can do 10 if we wanted to. All right, so from one to two, we had three. So that would be about there. Two to three, we also had three. Three to four, we had five. Four to five, we had eight. And five to six, we back to three again. And so, that, well, there. That would be what our uh, line graph would be. And this would be the differences. And this is going from exam to exam, okay? So exam one to exam two. And so we can see that this is the biggest one. So from exam, four to exam five was the biggest change, okay? And so that's that's what we would do for graphing these. And so that's the whole section wrapped up. And now I'll come back in a little bit and I'll do some more examples from our book.